Cultural Anthropology from the Universidad Nacional de Educación y Distancia. Did I pronounce it right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, National Distance Education University in Spain. Uh, he has done a number of field works in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Central America, South America, East Africa, and Europe for 20 years, right? Now he was he was a he was a visiting uh, researcher at the Southeast Asian Develop, uh, Department at the School of Oriental and African Studies and at the Department of Cultural Anthropology, London School of Economics and Political Science from 2011 to 2012. And at the same time, he was a uh, visiting researcher from the Department of Anthropology at the University of the Philippines from 2012 to 2014. And currently, he is a um, he is the uh, he is an associate researcher at the Research Institute of Mindanao Culture, which is otherwise known as RIMCO, which is RIMCO is currently based at the um, Xavier University um, Ateneo de Cagayan. So, uh, in 2015, uh, Dr. Yuch founded a small foundation in Kamigin, Kamigin Island. It is called Kilaha. Kilaha is uh, dedicated to documenting and supporting local and cultural uh, cultural identity of the people of Kamigin, and at the same time, preserving the biodiversity of the island of Kamigin. So at present, he is based in um, in Belgium, and at, at the same time in, in Spain, right? Spain and Belgium. Now I'm working as a senior consultant for the organization development supported. I, uh, is the ODS right? Totally right. Okay, so organization totally development right. support. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so to everyone, let us welcome Dr. Andres Yuch to present his Binalo talk entitled The Untold Stories of Kamigan Island. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, to be in there. It's I'm talking to you from uh, southwest Spain from the forest. It's early morning and uh, it's the first thing I do today is to, to share with you this, uh, this uh, glimpse, glimpse uh, and brief presentation I have, I have prepared for you uh, regarding the, uh, the, long, the book, the new book I wrote about the history, cultural history, uh, ethno history of Camille Island. So if I understand correctly, Anna, I have like a 30 minutes to present the book. Is that correct? Yes. And then we'll so, have some discussions after. Fantastic. So what I'm going to do now, if it's okay with you, what I'm going to do is to share my screen, which I prepare some slides for you to follow um, the presentation. Okay. So the title of the book um, is The Untold Stories of Camagin Island. And it has been published by the Xavier University Press in Cagayan de Oro. And before we start to introduce to you the, the, the highlights of the book, that is basically the highlights of the history of the island, uh, I want to, to brief you on the making of the book, how the, the process of making the book, because I think it's somehow is it's very important for you to understand later on the book. So I went to, to, to live in Camagin Island in 2011 to do my, uh, my PhD, the ethnography field research of my PhD in 2011. And during, I went in 2011 and I stayed there until 2018. So during all this time, uh, I mean, I have, was doing one year ethnography and then in my PhD, I was doing like a lot of bibliography research, which was very useful as well to this second book uh, of Camagin and uh, the Camagin history. You know? So I was living eight years in the island and I had the chance as well during all these years to, com to compile and to grasp um, a lot of oral history for elders, for locals, that they were sharing with me their knowledge, their legends, their beliefs, their older, older about the island. So I was very lucky in order to take notes and to to, to follow up and to talk with different people. 
And then later on, I was as well lucky in order to be able to access to different archives. I first went to the Recollets archives there in Quezon City, and I was looking at the Cosas Notables of Camin Island, specifically of Catarman, and I was able to read all the all the folder of 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 yeah cosas notables, which is like a, the, the, the highlights of the history of the island written by the, 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 the priests. No? But as well, I visited another, another uh, museum, another uh, archives and museums like Museo de Oro in Cagayan, in Cagayan de Oro, and the Jesuit Museum in, in Quezon City as well there in Manila. So um, as well, the book um, has another interesting sort of component for you to understand, and it's basically that the goal of the book was to reach out the young inhabitants of the island. Uh, and in order to reach them with my fundings and what with the, 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 yeah, about the, the fundings about the history of the island, um, I decided to create a fictional tales. I created, I decided to create fictional stories in order to, yeah, to reach them, in order to, 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 to attract their, their attention, in order to, yeah, to be able to connect with them. So then the book is, a, is, is framed by a lot of ethnohistory research, but then we think it has a small stories, micro stories of fiction in between different characters in order to display all this history and ethnographic fundings. And then uh, just to finish, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Camigin Island. How do you know how many of you have visited the island of Camigin? But um, if you go there, or those who have been there, know that people in the island believe that the name of Camigin comes from Camigin. And they say that in a very sort of uh, feeling very proud. No, come again means come again. No? So this book and this, uh, this work is about unpacking this. Uh, of course, as you know, come again uh, uh, doesn't come from the English of come again, but it comes from something much deeper, much richer, much older, and plenty of, of, of identity and pride. No? And this is what is the book about. Okay. So, then we can start. Um, sorry, I'm going to drink some water. The book starts, the first chapter goes about a little bit the natural history of the island, or how this the, the different the island of Camigin came across naturally, geographically, geologically. And um, as well, naturally, how the different uh, species came in, in order to colonize the island, and as well, how the last species to colonize the island was human beings, uh, came across in the island. Now, for, uh, as far as uh, Dr. Linda Barton and even Lee has been working on that, the population, the, 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 the arrival of the, of the humans into, into the island was around four to 2,000 years ago. Okay. At that time, the island, um, afterwards, after the, the arrival of, of these first inhabitants of the island, obviously were the Manobu from south, uh, from, uh, from the south, from North Mindanao. Um, at one point, there was like a, the, the, the island of Camigin that you have here later, we'll see a small, small map. The island of Camigin was sort of, uh, a sort of a mixture of different mandalas, of different kingdoms, of different groups. The first group was the, the, the Manobo group, you know, living in the highlands, living in the, in the forest, living in the jungle. And, um, and then the second group was the people living more in the, in the, in the coast, in the coast closer to Bohol to the Visayan area, to the Cebu area. No? And they were the people, the Visayan were the people of, of, the, of the sea, the people of the trade, the people that centralize, the people centralize a little bit their way of life. 
the people of the tattoos and the people of decoration. You know, they decorated. You know, we have a lot of sort of uh, evidences about how the Visaya people were sort of uh, in love with decorations and and and, and sophistications. So uh, Kami was like a, this sort of um, an island of these uh, yeah different groups having a relationship within the same island. No? Um, it's interesting um, that this a relationship before we are talking about, of course, the arrival of Europeans, this relationship was already shaped and uh, yeah, carved by the threat of the pirates coming from Sulu, uh, Maguindanao and Lanao. Okay, keep in mind that uh, according to Salsita, the war uh, in Maguindanao language, the word of uh, Bisaya means a slave per se. So there, there's a long tradition of trading in, in these seas and the Maguindanao and Lanao people as were well, trading at that time with humans. No? And in, in this, the way that affects to the people and the relationship in the, within Kamegin Island, um, that has a huge impact. Because uh, there was a, like, one of the mo most significant impact of this threat was like the construction, not the construction, but the use of Ilahan. Ilahan was like a natural uh, fortress, natural uh, sites uh, to defend themselves. They were quite high, like a 400, five meters, 500 meters high from the uh, sea level. And they were um, places where the, in the locals could see who is coming from the sea, but they could feel as well protected and they were, uh, they were hidden in, in the forest. No? So uh, all around the island, I can show you in the next, in the next, the next uh, slide, you can see that there are different Ilahans. Ilahans that form like a sort of ring along the island. And that's the places where the locals, both Visayan and, and, and Manobu, were defending from the pirates' arrivals. So this first part of the island of Kamigin uh, after uh, finished with the arrival of Europeans. Uh, in the in the summer of 1538, and um, it's interesting because the first the, the first Europeans who arrived to to the island of Camin were not the Spaniards but the Portuguese, and it was Francisco de Castro, Francisco de Castro, and he baptized uh, the king the king of Camin uh, under the name of Don Francisco. Okay. And this is the this is what it really the first part of the book is really about. No, is the the different cultures, the the, the the different mandalas, the different ways of living in the forest from the Manubu, adapting to the forest and hunting and and getting crops, and then the more sophisticated low uh, low land uh, lifestyle from the Visay. Okay. So we have here a map of the of of the island and. Uh, what I uh, the, the what I called before the 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 Ilahan are around the volcanoes and around the mountains. Okay, so we have like a pachal in the in the in the east side in green color with a with a with a tree. This is a Ilahan. Kato uh, Kato Horan the same in the west side. The, in the east side, sorry, the same is this uh, another Ilahan, and then we have another one in uh, in the south that is not in this map. Sorry, uh, it's called Tamawan. So these areas were these sort of rings in order to protect locals. And then, as I said before, the, in 1538, from the arrival of the of the Portuguese, we the island comes to a new chapter. And this chapter is their, their encounter with Europeans, their encounter with the foreign, the encounter with the, um, yeah, the Spanish priest and the new gods and the new diguatas. And as well, and very important for me, and for, uh, I, I hope that is well portrayed in the book, is the way that the locals domesticated the foreign, how they negotiate with the new gods, with the new uh, in, um, narratives with the new uh, yeah the new power coming from the outside and how they negotiated and how they domesticated that power in a way no? so um, in the first 
uh, mission in um, in Cameroon was the Jesuit mission in Kinsilivan. I go back, we go back to the map, okay, in order for you to see in the south. In Silivan, you can see in the south this, this is church there. That was the first settlement of the Jesuit. But they were not very lucky uh, because they were that area was very populated by the indigenous people, by the Manobos, and they didn't want to knee to the new gods. They were quite brave and they didn't like that much. And then that area was as well very, and the pirate straits were very often going there. So the, the priest could not, the, the Jesuit priest couldn't set in that part of the island and they withdrew later on. No? Um, but in 1622, uh, from Tandam in, in, south, in North Mindanao, the recollects already set there with the Spanish army, they already set a sort of camp there. And from there, six priests, six recollects priests, walk from the rivers, from the uh, Butuan River and go into the seaside and then jumping into coming in, were able to, during those years, were able to somehow to convert some of the inhabitants of North Mindanao and coming in island. It's interesting because when they arrived, when the priests arrived to come in, to come in island, they didn't set in the north, in the south, as as the Jesuits that they settled down in Sliban. The the Agustina Recoletos preferred to settle down in Catarman, in the west side. Okay, if you see in the, in, the, in your le in the left side of your map, which is the west side, um, you can see the Catarman, and that's the place where we set, they settled. And they found that it was they were it was easier for them to relate to the to the Visaya, and to protect from the uh, from the pirates uh, tribes. Okay. Um, it's interesting because at this, it was in 1622 where uh, they built in Gaborai Catarman, which you see there, um, the first church. And that was 1622. And the construction of this church was the center. You know that at that time, the church were not only church, but they were as well the schools, they were as well the fortress. For protection, they were everything, right? So the construction of this first church from where uh, the, 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 the priest uh, convert and Christianize the population of Kamegin Island, at that time, approximately 1,000 people, is today under the sea. And it's today, people don't know about this center. And it's well located and it's well documented in these archives from the recollects, but it's not and, and translate it into the into the knowledge of the local government today, and um, yeah, it's, the, the the site remains silent and unknown under the sea. And it's just when this um, I don't know if you have seen the pictures of the sunken, sunken cemetery of Camayn Island that there is across that. So for the locals and for the local government and for all the documentation there, this is the sunken cemetery. But that was not only a cemetery. There are many other ruins around there, like, the, as I said before, the church. Anyway, so as we will see later, this is part of your job in the future. Go there and to do some more inspirations and to find out that church that is beyond the Sanctum Cemetery, okay? So, sorry, there is someone who is making some noise in my computer, but we go ahead. Uh, the negotiations um, is interesting. In this uh, second chapter of the book, the, ne the negotiation in between the waters, the Christian God that offered this sort of centralization of gods, that in one God was able to uh, foresee and to forecast and to offer protection to all the to all the inhabitants of the people, and how the negotiation was with or in comparison with the different gods that the Kamanovo people and the Visaya people were having, because as you know, they were polytheists and they were having many gods for many different reasons and with many different narratives, you know, the rivers, the sea, the trees, the leaves, the stones, the rice. So there, there were plenty. No? So there was a negotiation of gods in between this Christian God and the, and the native gods. No? And the book tries to capture that as well, no? like uh, this, this sort of 
tension, but as well domestication, tension, but as well communication or, or coming together, putting these two traditions of beliefs together. No? That this is still ongoing in the island. And then the, 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 another interesting um, feature that I try to, to portray in the book, in this chapter, in this second chapter, is the negotiation between the patriarchal uh, kinship system that the Spaniards and the, the priest brought to Camigin Island and to the Philippines in general against the bilateral kinship of the local population. No? The Pisayan were bilateral and the Manubu were sort of a mixture of, of, of uni, um, a patriarch, unilateral and bilateral systems. No? So there is, I, I, for me, that's a very interesting, a very interesting aspect of the, the arrival of and the colonization of the Spaniards or the, the conversion of the, of the, of the local Camigenians into Christianity. No? There, was, there was not only a negotiation of gods or negotiation of uh, beliefs, there was a, a something deeper and stronger, that it was the structure and the power within the households and the family. The, the, the Spaniards were saying like, hey, you need to, you need to uh, uh, deal with your family in, in a patriarchal way, hierarchical way, with the male on the top, while the locals were more having more uh, usual to, or more, yeah, sort of more um, used to horizontal links in between the family members, in between the gender of the family. And this sort of hierarchical patriarchal way was not very well sort of welcomed by the locals. No? There is a book that I strongly recommend to you by Bridwell uh, called The Holy Confrontation, that it, it really approached this, this same fascinating topic. Um, well, this, in, this, in this part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, yeah, this part of the history of the island, there was another big component that it was about the taxes. As you know, the priests, the Spanish priests, were asking the locals, the natives, both the Visayan and the Manobus, to pay taxes to the, back to, to the Spanish king and to, yeah, to the Spanish king kingdom. No? So, I, and they were doing that mainly by allocating all the people by under what they call the, the policy of bajo la campana, no? which means like a, attracting to the people to live under the bell no? in order to have a census, to count them, to have them under control basically, and to somehow to regulate their days, their activities and their livelihoods and their relationships. So, but they have to pay taxes and the people were more and more the, the frustrating, uh, frustrated. they were having an increase in the frustration when it comes to the payment of these taxes. No? So some people living bajo la campana under the bell decided to go and to leave the village, Catarman village, and not to pay any more taxes. And they were going to the mountains, to the Ilahan, remember? And then, other people from the Ilahan, from the highlands, the remontados, were going down to the low, the lowland, to the coast, to Gatterman, to the church, to stay under the, under the bill, under the bell, bajo la campana, and to pay taxes, aiming to search for protection. So there was like, a, some people were leaving the, the village, the Spanish village, or the, the, the recollect village, because they were dreaming of freedom, while others, were coming down into that village in search of protection. And that produced like a sort of traffic in between the island, in between the lowland and the highland. And that there was the melting box as well, when it comes to ethnicity, the mixture of between the remontados, Manubu, and the Visaya and the lowland, and going up and going down, right? So that I try to portray that sort of uh, melting point uh, or melting pot of, of, uh, in, this, in this chapter in the book. And then as a result of this sort of frustration and uh, by, by the locals, by the natives, um, the first church of Punta Pasin, that I was mentioning to you before that you have to go to do explorations, I hope soon, uh, it was born in, a, in a 1797. The natives made a fire. It was a sort of rebellion. They didn't want to pay any more taxes. Uh, and this, all, this story that I'm telling you about this, the, the, the construction of the church, the rebellion, all this is, again, unknown. It's not documented. So we need to go there and to find it. Uh, sorry, Lee, I am advocating, as you can see, a lot from that. Um, 
And then the construction of the new, after the, the fire, the recollects and the locals decided to, to, to build a new church, which is known as the old church. And basically it's the church that you see in the pictures today. Okay, and if you go to the to the Kamegin websites and pictures, you will see the old church. And uh, uh, this is the old church we are talking about, but it was built in 1806, not in 1622, as they say. So there is a lot of work to surface, a lot of a lot of um, dates and events. Of course. This construction of the new church, I mean, this new church in 1806 was then again destroyed by the volcanic eruption in 1871. So this church that you see in the picture, it only was alive for 80 years, while the one that nobody knows about was for 250 years. Okay, so there's a massive difference there for us to document and to dig uh, deeper. Sorry. Mm, then I'm gonna I'm gonna um, because I will say this 30 minutes I'm getting close to 30 minutes and I don't want to I could keep on talking a lot about the history of Camerun as you can see it, it really fascinating fascinates me. There is another two chapters of the book that it goes more about local legends for local history. Okay, but this local lay is a local history that I gathered first from um, uh, listening to the elders and I documented listening to the elders. I found some of them as well in the manuscripts uh, from the Agustina Recoletos in the archives. So the combination of the two, when I saw, oh, there is some, some of those things that these people are telling orally still are in the back, in the papers of the priests 300 or 400 years ago. So one of these leaders, uh, one of these uh, legends is the local hero, Dato Mihun, who was a waiver, but as well a um, a healer, a traditional healer, and with a very strong charisma personality, and was the one who was able to put together the different ethnic groups and people and groups of, of in the island, no, to fight against the pirates. And I thought he was able, the one who led somehow, who was heading the union of the Visaya, the Manubus, and the Spaniards together to fight against the pirates. And they were having a major fight in 1858, leading by the, by this waiter, by, by this Datu. And I document that in the book and I display like a, a, all the documentation I found both in oral history and in the in the archives. And then the final history I try to portray in the in the in the book, and it's in the last chapter, is regarding um, yeah, Basilio Mavilanga and the legend of the old volcano explosion in 1871. That's a story that represents very well the tensions in between local knowledge, the, the knowledge of the locals, and the foreign, the, the, the Christian knowledge, and how they engage to each, each other, no? and the tensions and difficulties they have. This Basilio Mavilanga was a old man, wise man, as well, sort of a um, uh, uh, with a lot of wisdom and traditional knowledge, and he was able to predict somehow when the volcanic eruption explosion was going to happen in 1871, first of May. He and he went and reported to the uh, authorities, the church, the Christian authorities, and of course the Christian authorities didn't follow because that was not from their knowledge and from their gods, and there was something from the periphery, something from the outside, and it's like a but then it did happen. What he was able to foresee and to forecast, it did happen. So the book, and sorry, the last chapter is about that tension between local knowledge and the Christian knowledge and how later on the priests were feeling so sort of uh, sad and guilty for not listening to this wise uh, old elder person uh, with the, his stories and narratives. No? So, and these are just for you to, to, to know that these are the last two chapters of the, of the book, you know, the, regarding local heroes and local knowledge. And just to finish, and I finish now, I promise to you, it's like, I just want to make, make to pass to you my advocacy uh, message, you know, which is basically, we hope that soon 
we are able to organize for a, a sort of archaeological explorations in Camden Island in order to verify some of the findings of this research of this book, but as well even to go further. No? And I, I, I make sort of three highlights here for you to, to pay attention if you have a chance to to, 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 uh, to come in um, to work on. So basically is to, uh, as I know Neri uh, Lee is super interested in Gilsilivan Church, and of course, to go and to do some, some, uh, some uh, underwater explorations and to find out what is this chart from, because we, oh, this, this ruins from, with the, we, I personally believe that they are uh, Agustin and Recolette's um, ruins, but it could be something different. So we need to find out uh, what is this. No? And as I say before, the Sanken Cemetery versus Punta Pastil. So everybody knows what is the, uh, this church in the middle of the sea, uh, they call it the Science and Cemetery, but through this research in the archives, we, we believe that there is much more down there in the water. So we need to explore and to find out. And then again, and just to finish, uh, and I did it with Dr. Alinda Barton from, from Xavier University to go into the Ilham places in order to, to find as well some archaeological uh, 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 tangible um, materials uh, that we believe that I, even though that most of the artifacts were on, on bamboo and natural, and, and natural uh, materials, still we have found as well some ceramics um, uh, potteries that it could be very interesting in this in these specific places. So basically, this is this is what I have prepared for you today. This is basically my the introduction I have prepared of a, of the book, and I am now totally open to to talk and to answer and to comment with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Andres. Uh, I think we can have some questions as well, and this is a part where we can have a discussion. For everyone who might have a question, we can have, uh, you can put your questions on the chat, or if you're feeling shy, you can also direct message me or our other uh, moderator, Arturo, or, or Ara Espigar, who's AM Espigar, or alternatively, you can also click below the reaction button and then you can pick the, you can, uh, you can also, after the reactions, you can raise your hand and then we'll call you. So you can unmute yourself and you can also raise, you can also turn on your video. All right. Uh, we have, I have some other questions, but there's a question here. And I think this is a good point because Miss um, Rita is, asking, she's from coming in and she's asking, how can she access your book? So I think that's the first question that a lot of people want to ask. Yeah, uh, the book is published. I am not very good on, on, on commercial, uh, <laughs> as you can see. The book is published by Xavier University Press and we could share later, uh, Anna, we could share later the link in order to order the book. Okay? All right, yes. All and right. that will be, we can also put it uh, for everyone else. Uh, if you remember the Facebook page that we shared, if you have Facebook, uh, we will put it in the comments as an addition for the link where you can get it or for more information. That Fantastic. You All right. Fantastic. 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 Uh, I think mm -hmm. there, there And are, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of a quick add on to that. Are, is it only physical copies or are there uh, uh, going to be uh, PDF versions as well or, you know, some sort of electronic form of these? Mm -hmm. uh, of your book? Both ebook, you have an ebook, and you have a, a paper copy. Both, so okay. up to you. Perfect. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's something that we can also explore. That's a great idea as well. Thanks for asking that, JJ. Uh, are Are there other questions? Uh, Doctor Paz has a question. Hello, and uh, hello, Andres. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, and congratulations for uh, the publication. Uh, I suppose that came out. Um, last year during the pandemic or just before, no? And uh, I'm uh, interested in many things that you've been doing and, uh, and I've done at uh, Kamigin. Uh, but first, um, it, it's fascinating that you managed to demonstrate at least a solid time depth for, a, for an oral tradition, an oral story, narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a story about, um, was it, 
Datu Mehom or was it the mm -hmm. Datu uh, Mehom? Yeah, which you then um, also read in the accounts of the Augustinians. Um, what is your view now, given that you are someone who has done this? Uh, how much do you think we can uh, establish time debt or trust or tradition in, in, in a society? You know, in, uh, like uh, 300 years, uh, can we go further than 300 years, 500 years? and say that if we record uh, details from oral traditions, can this be um, something that we can, we can, uh, can, we can trust? Mm -hmm. Or uh, as we go further in time, of course, mm -hmm. we appreciate it more for its, um, for its cultural, uh, other cultural traits of this oral tradition. But as mm -hmm. a historical, um, as a historical information, uh, how far back can you be, uh, you for your personally, uh, will, will you be comfortable with um, hmm. Hmm. Uh, in your experience, Ron, I like... Um, hmm. Well, uh, thanks, Victor. First of all, nice to talk to you. It's a long, long time that we don't talk to each other. I remember when I was doing, I was doing my, my, the other book in the Comedia that you like very much, the idea of the Comedia, and I, I felt very uh, happy with that, with your feedback. Um, uh, to answer your question, Victor, um, it's a very good question. Um, I would, to answer it, I would feel comfortable. I found evidences in the archives of these oral histories back 200 years ago. 200 years ago, more or less. Yeah. So beyond that, uh, that's that's the way I can answer. And it's up to us, no? How how brave we we feel. <laughs> going it, it, that's why your work is important. Mm -hmm. it, we need things like this, no? Uh, demonstrating that we can link the oral tradition with, uh, and that how how far it goes. And what's what's wonderful about your data, you can you can see the difference. You know, there will be difference between what was recorded two hundred years ago and what you recorded. And you will then be able to put a baseline of, uh, of elements in that story that are are more are older, and mm -hmm. and what are younger. You, you know, it's easy. For example, uh, in old folklore studies, where they would say, "Oh, okay, oh, oh, if, oh they already had metal, so uh, therefore, if there's metal, then it should it could be uh, older than with, with prior to metal, just for sake of example." Mm -hmm. But now you see the problem is how do you differentiate it within the last two, 300 years, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where we have to find other markers that mm -hmm. uh, will tell us at least a differentiate time, you know, within mm -hmm. elements of, within a time span where it mm -hmm. is more difficult to, uh, to differentiate. Of course, you know, if they talk about plastic, then it's easy, but most mm -hmm. folklore will not talk about material culture that is modern, if it is there, then it's easy, you know, but mm -hmm. there are subtle mm -hmm. ones that are hard to, to pick up, you know, mm -hmm. but in your, in your narrative, uh, then those subtle things can be picked up, mm -hmm. which is also interesting because, uh, and it's in your proposal, this is something different but parallel. Uh, in your survey of Kamigan, did you actually, did you manage to go to those Ilian, uh, they call it uh, Ilaham, Ilians, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you, you've been to those uh, Ilahans, no? Uh, there were no walls. You didn't see any wall, any like dry stone walling on the nuns, no. And, and you said they were in the middle, no? In, in, in the, what could have been forested in, in those days. No? But mm -hmm. were they in higher positions, promontories? Mm -hmm. They were high positions, good visibility, yeah. hidden. Yeah, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. It, it just recalls. Uh, the the uh, essay of uh, Zeus Salazar on on um, he was I, I'm not sure Anna do you know if Zeus recorded the uh, Kamigin Ilian uh, in his uh, monograph? Uh, I can't remember. If, I think it was recorded because Kamigin is well has a good record of Ilian as well. And just on the side, uh, Andres, the <laughs> what is the etymology of Katarman? You know, mm. uh, well, I, I think it's a Bisaya war. If I remember, C C C uh, Cape is from Cape, from a yeah. point of going outside. Uh -huh. 
because there's a famous place in Samar, no, of course, which is Katarman. Mm -hmm. And Samar is very okay, Warai, you know, but but um, I was just surprised to see Katarman as a place, a prominent place name also in Kamigan. So I was just wondering if there's something behind the the word. You know? But you said it, it's something that uh, like a banwa, no, something like that. Isn't it a boat? Sorry, sorry. Uh, from what I remember, Katarman. Yeah, yeah. I, I could be wrong, but that's what I remember. Yeah, but the, the spelling is different. Kat, yeah. Katar, yeah, but Katarman is close to a boat. Uh, the spelling is very similar to the, the way we call it boats as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. But this, it, it, Lim knows better because I believe that this is from Visaya and it's with Ki, not with C, and it's Katatman. But Katarman is the translation, the adaptation into the Spanish with the C and the R. Maybe Lim knows a little bit more. The, did you do this research? Okay. I'm sorry, Lee. Uh, sorry. So, yeah, Katarman is uh, Katatman in Visaya. Which is a point or uh, overlooking, overlooking the coasts. So this spelling is Katagman. Is, okay. So Katagman. Mm -hmm. Was was uh, Linda Burton involved in your research uh, for this? Yeah, project? yeah, yeah, yeah. We went together to the Ilahan to two of them yeah. when she was quite, and she was yeah, yeah, she was involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I think Lee's plan, uh, well, you know, he, she, uh, too bad she didn't see the publication of your book, but she passed away mm -hmm. uh, quite, quite recently. But Lee was, uh, I think Lee was one of uh, Linda's favorite students when, uh, mm -hmm. when he was an undergrad. <laughs> I know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, 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 just to finish, uh, Victor, um, before the publication of this book, we did a paper together. Linda and I, in, in Kinatman uh, journey, uh, Journal in mm. Xavier University, with all the academic, with all the historical, archaeological, uh, archival funding, sorry. So just to put them, and then the book is later, yeah. is afterwards. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, yeah. I think uh, there are some other questions. Um, well, first, there's a question uh, asking how much is the book, or maybe you can, you have an idea. <laughs> So this is your marketing uh, strategy. Already. Yeah, exactly. My marketing strategy is yeah, it's just a blind study. I don't remember the, the the I think it's three hundred something peso, but I don't remember. It will make a good gift for Christmas, I think, for for your family. So as early as May, you can start uh, collecting your copies and sending it out to your family in Mindanao. Oh, okay. So that's the uh, yeah. this is the book. Right. Oh, wow. Did... Oh, here it is. <laughs> this so is then... another version. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there's somebody from the chat, uh, Kate Lim, uh, put in the link for the book where you can order yeah. it, and it is 290 pesos. So it's very yeah. cheap. Very, um, it's affordable. very affordable for everyone, for students. It's good, yeah. And I, it will really be a good. Gift. Actually, this is under the um, XU Press from Xavier, from Xavier University. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. Good to know they are publishing good work. Yeah, and uh, primary data and everything. Uh, Andreas, did did you 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 mentioned that your archival work were on the archives of the in Quezon City of the Recollects. And, but now you're in España. Did you, uh, did you manage to look into the archives there uh, in, in Spain? I was so lucky, Victor, because while, while I was doing the, 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 the checking mm -hmm. and while I was visiting in Quezon City in Manila, mm -hmm. uh, the archives of the Recollects, I got two volunteers in the, the town of uh, Navarra, Pamplona, north of Spain, when the main recollects archives are a monastery is. Oh, wow. And they were doing at the same time that I was doing the checking in Manila, they were doing it there in the, in the monastery. Oh, wonderful. And with, wonderful, wonderful. And we found exactly the same. Okay. So there is nothing else here in, in Spain than there in Manila. They are exactly the same sources. And documents. Oh, that's good. They can well, compare. 
Sorry. Which is also uh, something I was just wondering, uh, two, uh, two levels, if there's memory in the people that in the oral tradition of, uh, of course, there's memory of the warriors, no? World War II, but was there memory of any kind of the Philippine-American War? Or is there any uh, accounts of the Philippine Revolution of 1896 onwards? in Kamigan hmm. Island. Hmm. Uh, are you familiar with it or did you encounter um, any? Uh, yeah, there are some. There are some uh, leaders, some legends about leaders, uh, rebels against the American, the American, uh, yeah. But I didn't, I didn't work on that. Yeah. So I didn't, because it, it goes beyond my, my frame. Hmm. My time so frame. For <laughs> volume two, I was what? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, for volume two. <laughs> Well, because there's still more untold stories of coming in, and maybe you can of, also expand it to other parts, relationships with yeah. Mindanao. Mm. Right. I, I, I basically think, Anna, I basically, sorry, Victor, yep. I, 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 I believe that the, the story that we, we surface in, in this book on coming in island is so similar to, to many islands in, in, in the Philippines. It's so similar. The, yeah. Yes. And actually, that's what I was also going to comment about the histories of small islands, whether because we also have other islands as well, like Batanes, or this are there similarities on how their histories are parallel regarding when the, when the Spanish arrived or when new people arrived, things like that. Uh, so it would be interesting to see it in a historical, per a historical archaeological perspective, which I suppose this is uh, the work of uh, other, of the Lee. Uh, yes, sir. Dick. No, no, I was just, uh, just to follow up what you're saying, Anna. When, when Mandy and I, when we were very young and we were asked by Bong Bison to survey Batanes, we, we went up to every single um, Ijang, which is a version of, of, uh, the, Ilian, of the Ilians no? in the Batanes. And the pattern was, of course, you have the Ijangs and then the Nakabahayans, which are the settlements nearby. So I was wondering in in um, in Kamigin if if you have the the Ilahans, uh, how far are the, uh, the settlements? You know, does one Ilahan represent one settlement, or, or what is the correlation between uh, those places of uh, uh, you know defense and refuge, mm -hmm. and uh, and the settlements or communities around it, you know, mm -hmm. and how far they that would be a good study to look into. Also. Yeah, yeah. So totally. can, after the reduction, uh, of course, where you know a lot of these old settlements are are not there anymore. You know, so mm. they were all concentrated. And, uh, mm. Mm. Which brings me: Did you did you record any folklore regarding Hibokibo, Mount Hibokibo? No, <laughs> because because in the um, 80s, early 80s, I think, when the UP mountaineers first went to climb it, there were, they claim, they claim uh, back then that there were, uh, people were afraid of the mountain uh, and uh, you know, the mountain top, and there was so much uh, mystery and folklore connected to it. I was just wondering if you, uh, if, if you did that, then that would have confirmed it. You know? But now yeah. it's a double oral history. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're taking it from the from the UP students who went there back in the eighties and and claiming they heard all this folklore about the mountains and then of course they broke it when they hmm. when they climbed when it they and came down for safe. No? Yeah, so. hmm. There's a good collection of folklore and songs and poetry in Museo de Oro archives as well by Padre Francisco. Yeah, the I, no? Ah. Demetrio, is it? No. Francisco Demetrio, exactly, exactly. And there is a good collection of all, uh, many materials, uh, cultural materials, uh, mm, for those who want to go deeper than the book went. Mm. All right, I think there's another question. Um, yes, or, there's a question here by uh, mm -hmm. June Velez, and they ask uh, the new or they say, the new doctrina given to the Recollects in 1622 by Bishop Arke of Cebu uh, of, uh, for Northeastern Mindanao. Uh, and they're interested to know uh, what, made, what made them venture into Kam Kamigin uh, that same year and who were they? 
Well, that's that. That I have the same question. I mean, it's fascinating that they just to picture six priests from Tandan uh, Fortress going down to the river from uh, Butuan River and encountering the locals and the interactions they had with the natives. And I mean, this is. Um, what did they make them adventure to Mindanao? Well, I cannot answer that. The way I could answer that is like uh, what I read in, in, in the Jesuit uh, uh, archive of Pedro um, Chirino book, is like a, they use uh, coming in as a step stone from Cebu area to Mindanao. So probably they were, <laughs> they were, they were doing the same in the, in, the, in the opposite direction. I don't know. I, I mean, this, this uh, I don't, I, it's just our imagination, the way to answer that, no? I mean, Hmm. That so, isn't it the closest island from Bohol? Maybe they were coming in from Bohol, no? Like mm -hmm. mostly exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. was always there was always an exchange between Bohol and uh, mm -hmm. Kamigin, if I remember correctly. Even up Very, to now. Up to now. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's the major influence of Kamigin is from Bohol. Yeah. In and terms of language, in terms of pottery, in terms of ma many but pottery. Locals say that they, they had that pottery, yeah. pottery making in the island, and it was coming from, from a hole. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's no more pottery making uh, when you were there, Andres. No, no. I didn't find any, and I searched for it. Huh? Yeah. I, 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 I asked quite a lot. I didn't find any. Oh, On the other side, I, my relatives, the Juke family, the artists, I don't know if you know Julie Juke. Yes, and, of uh, Okay. So when, when they went, when they were in coming in with me, they saw that the clay was very high quality clay. Yeah. And they, they felt like, oh, that's an excellent clay to make pottery. Yeah. But at the same time, historically, we didn't find any evidence of pottery. Hmm, okay. That would be interesting. I also have a follow-up question with that, but I think um, there's a chat a question from Ayar, Gradio, and Michael Paluga. Uh, mm -hmm. They're asking... Uh, uh, Michael said, hello, Andres, kumusta? I was wondering how you would explain the, durabil the durability of the transmission of their oral stories. And hmm. yeah. What a good question. I think it's pride. No, I think it's, it's the way, it's the heritage, the legacy in order to survive and to cope with the, the challenges of each generation. I and mean, it's, that's the legacy they offer, no? These legends, this, the fusion of the legends is a way to cope as humans and yeah that's the that's the way i, I would answer that that's why i think it's tongue-in-cheek when they say when when it's when when they answer to the question what what does kamigin mean and they say come again to come yeah. again yeah i think that's tough i think they're, they're kidding they're not, they're yeah. not serious about that i think yeah, they're, they're 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 they're, they're making a joke <laughs> some of them, yes, Victor. Some of them make a joke. Others yeah. believe it already. <laughs> you, you, yeah. So we need to deconstruct that as soon as possible. I mean, like, <laughs> every time that it's being repeated, it becomes more serious. It gains ground. Correct. Yeah, and exactly. And the old people don't don't question it anymore. Yeah. And they say, just uh, yeah, come in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but is there a Oh, June Velez also has a follow-up. Bohol went to the Recollects only after the expulsion of the Jesuits. Uh, so I guess it's also, there's also that uh, change. He was direct messaging me. So um, I guess that's also one of the things that we can also look at uh, when looking at the archives as well. And but, but weren't the Jesuits much later in Mindanao? I mean, only when they came back after their last expulsion. I don't know. No, I, 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 if I remember correctly, I, but correct me if I'm wrong, the Jesuits were also in Mindanao earlier, but they the were. Beginning? Yeah. 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 And they were expi expelled and they came back there. Exactly. That's yeah. the way, that's the way I, I recall it. Yeah. Mm. And it was mm. also um, in the, in the archaeology that Lee was speaking uh, before he was looking through the archive where there were presence of Jesuits, but it was only for a very short time, I think. So mm. maybe there was influence, but we're not exactly sure how much of an influence mm. it was in terms of Jesuit versus Recollects as opposed to Catholics versus 
not merchants, Catholics and uh, uh, the people there. Mm -hmm. Zambonga ba? Zambonga. Uh, Hi. Ay, ako si, si Aya, it's me. Aya, Aya, yes. Yeah, no, uh, the Jesuits were in Zamboanga? Mm, earlier. In Zamboanga. Earlier in Zamboanga. Okay, so Western. But Zamboanga. in the 19th century. Hi, I'm here, Pala. Well, oh, through... okay. My fell only in the 19th century in Zamboanga, not earlier. Earlier, earlier, much earlier in Zamboanga. And then they were expelled and then they returned and uh, covered much of the island, especially in Davao. Yeah. And uh, up to Bubu, uh, uh, Northern. Northern. Mm. They, they returned with a vengeance, no? I mean, I suppose. With a vengeance. Because, because by the way, I, I recall it, because they, their old properties were taken over, right? So when they came back, they have to, they have to go and be missionary, look for more, for new properties that were not. Most of them. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I, 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 go, I think... I, Sorry, I think they were uh, they were uh, the Jesuits and the Recollects were coexisted uh, before in the island of in the island of uh, in the island of uh, Mindanao. That's why there was a uh, a religious ordinance dividing Mindanao into west and then to the east, mm. making the uh, Gindingan to Dabao, which is giving the portion of the western part to the Jesuits and the eastern part to the to the Recollects. So that's how they penetrated Mindanao. And I think I believe that based on historical records, these are uh, the, uh, after the expulsion of the of the Jesuits, the uh, recollects from from from, from uh, I think from the one they wanted to penetrate Cagayan de Oro, which mm -hmm. is Cagayan, no, uh, the villages in Cagayan. But in mm -hmm. order for them to penetrate the the northern part, they have to channel it to uh, to the mother of uh, uh, to uh, uh, I think the I forgot the name of the datu. So the mother lives in Kamigin. So they have to wait from Butuan, went to, to Kamigin, and then they have to get the intercession from the mother to permit them to go to Northern Mindanao. Mm -hmm. So that's how in 1622, that was the history of Kagayan, where oh. Kagayan was Christianized by the recollects. Hmm. Lee, Lee when, when you were planning to excavate in Kamigin, your plan yeah. was, was good to connect, right? To connect Kamigin with your excavations mm -hmm. in the coast, right? Up to, mm -hmm. what, what's the name of that site that you, what's the site nearest to come oh, Ginsiliban. Ah. Ginsiliban. Ginsiliban, well, uh, Ginsiliban was technically uh, penetrated by the Jesuits mm -hmm. before before the recollects, right? So that's mm -hmm. when you're able to to build this uh, this port, which is Ginsiliban. So watch watch over the, uh, for the pirates, Moro pirates coming from, from Mindanao. So that's why, the word uh, etymology of Ginsiliban, Ginsiliban mm -hmm. in Visaya. Mm -hmm. So to watch Lee, over. Lee, we don't know exactly if that particular tower is Jesuit or, uh, or recollects. Mm -hmm. We are not yeah. sure. And this is what we need to find out. Yes, exactly. It could be both. Exactly. It, could be, it could be both. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But well, yeah, the, uh, I, I would like interesting. To, I, and I would like to add to your agenda when going back to Kamegin, because I, I will not be there anymore because somehow I was spelled out of the island. You were here. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is to, is to include it, to include um, Punta Pasil, the Sunken Cemetery. I, I remember I, I, I was there in 2010, right? That was the last time that we surveyed the island. And then mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, Nanette. Nanette was 2010, right? Was that 2010? Yeah, oh, it was 2010. You didn't come, you didn't return after 2010? Oh, well, we were supposed to go back, but apparently we were also expelled oh. <laughs> by the, <laughs> by the oh. yeah, <laughs> governor. <laughs> <laughs> but Lee, your first visit to Kapigin was with Father Demetrio, right? You were, you were working with Father Demetrio. <laughs> He's already dead. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, but that was know. a very interesting one of the oldest sites that we, we found in 2010 was in Pakal. Remember Aya, the, the Ilihan, right? Pakal is a very nice site where we were able to recover earthenware shirts, okay? Earthenware shirts that we that has a very, um, uh, uh, very good design, right? Uh, very good design. At the same time, we were able to, uh, uh, well, that was the site where the uh, uh, plantation of uh, Sansones. 
So the artifacts were, were mixed with Dylan Solis while we were picking all those materials mm -hmm. on the ground. Not bad. So it's a, we were, yeah, yeah right? Uh, I, if you can remember that. I remember the lansones. <laughs> <laughs> In the mainland, is it also Ilahan? Is it also, what do you mean? Ilihan. 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 So only in, um, it's only in Kamigin, it's Ilahan. Ila, Ilahan. No? Mm. Ilahan. So, or sometimes it, in, in, in Northern Mindanao, Ilihan or Alihan. Alihan. Alihan, which is to watch over to guard. It's the same uh, mm. etymology. Um, Sorry, I would like. Can I? Can I have? Oh, can I make a question? Sorry, ahead, <laughs> we are reversing. Ahead, the, of course, this is, super this nice is the, to reverse the. This is the part of it. Go ahead. I like very much the question of Aya, and I just offer a potential version of, uh, you know, uh, uh, an, only an, uh, a sort of perspective to that answer. No? And I would like to listen from her. Uh, how how she would answer have that question? It's like, uh, what what about the durability of this transmission of the oral histories? Why do you remain so alive, according to you? Yeah, that, that actually isn't my question. That's that's my first question because he's also working on he's also working on epics and oral tradition. So mm -hmm. the question of durability is um is uh, of course of course very important. So maybe you want to share your thoughts about durability. It's you the, have a lot. It's the gold standard in. <laughs> the, the, this is Vancina. It's, it's not easy to answer really, but in, in, nice we, we are working on the idea that there are redundancies in a cultural system, like in the language, in uh, specific practices like epic chanting, in social organization, and others. And if you see some correlations in those like uh, levels or domains, of a similar pattern, maybe it's the one that is propping the durability. Like even if like uh, you cancel a structure in a practice, it can be reconstructed because there are other facets. Mm -hmm. In general, I'm working on that idea, but, yeah. but the, the, the key question is really the data. Like when you say there are similar and durable forms from the archive to the oral history, mm -hmm. I want to know if the, the similarity is lodged on a specific information or in a particular phrase or in a particular story form or a theme. Mm -hmm. or a theme. Because it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it differs if you assess yeah. the durability. So those are kind of like the elements that you can look mm -hmm. at um, if we want to be able to characterize mm -hmm. that durability a bit better. I mean, is it just the narrative? Is it just a name? Is it just a, a character? You know, so those are the things that that that, um, that we can that we can think about. Interesting. I I think that's uh, there's something there, no? Because uh, often you think if the community is lucky and they they have individuals who, who are people who you know um, inherit the information and then articulate, then it will carry on. But I don't think that's uh, that's part of the durability. You may, uh, you may have, like in your case, no, uh, of all your informants um, in Kamigin, uh, was there someone who's super spectacularly gifted with the memory and, and who can uh, chant or recite all tradition? I, did you ever encounter anyone like that? No. Um, Andres, no. no. Mm -hmm. So your informants were actually people who were just there was it was there it, it, it remained in their in their consciousness hmm. uh, and maybe my my feel has a, has a point there no? and I like that my feel that it's not a singular explanation yeah there has to be a, a, a confluence of several elements in society for it to to survive no? for hmm. this hmm. for a form of this knowledge to to survive can I can I add uh, uh, Vic and uh, Andres. I really like this theme in your book. I wish I could purchase it now. Because so we I, can I, buy it and send it to you. I'm very interested in those books which emphasizes continuities more than breaks because we have too many books about breaks. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, very interesting to note that for 
200 years, and that is roughly within colonial period. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to maintain continuity if you have no prop from your cultural or social system, right? No? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that very short moment, relatively short, like even 200 years, that is the context wherein people are so much harassed by external forces. But the continuity is there, as you said. So how much more in the period before that? So I would say now, wow, the continuity is really something. That's why we, hmm. I don't, yeah, we have been we, talking we, about this <laughs> a week before. And, <laughs> and after, after the, we, the, the way, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh, uh, well, I was just going to say that I think there's a question that might prop uh, help others people, other people to be propped on the background of what we're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. JJ. Yeah. So it's from the user Mon Man Mac, and he's. They say, uh, I can only imagine pre-Hispanic uh, other side of Bohol is Bisaya culture, uh, pintados, while on the other side was Muslim. I understand uh, Tagaloan Villanueva, Misamis Oriental, was uh, was Misamis Oriental side was Muslim. Not well versed though. Uh, just have read some, and yeah, I guess that was his comment. Is the because if I remember correctly, and maybe this is also addressed in your book, or because there are other people who are studying Mindanao here, uh, I guess the question is the Tagaloan Villanueva side of Misamis Oriental was Islamic. Um, I, although I would say I, I've been reading about this recently, I think it wasn't Islamic during that time, the Misamis Oriental. Side, it became Islamic at around. It was it did become Islamic at around 15th century, more or less, or 14th century. I could I could be wrong, um, because I know that the oh, despite the Maginda now the Lanao Lake um, histories, given the Lanao Lake histories, uh, they were already they it was already Islamic, but there are some portions that were not. This is something that could do, do any of you have some uh, comments or ideas on that? Sorry. Me? Yes. Uh, ah, sorry. Well, oh, no, I, well, I, anyway. uh, no, but I, I, I can I can provide very little about yeah, very little evidence about that. I mean I have a very similar impression that you have, Anna. Uh, I have an very yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. I think also the Bohol, just to answer Mon Man Max uh, mm -hmm. question, uh, the Bohol Bisaya culture, the, the Repentados was referring to the Samar Leite uh, group, not the Bohol people. If I if I, I could, if anyone would like to correct me, but I think that was the uh, Bisaya that was being referred for the Pintados. Um, mm -hmm. All right, and th but this is something that other people can also explore more because uh, the Lano Lake uh, area was very highly populated. And this, I guess this is also my question regarding its relationship to Kamigin. When you mention Kamigin, it's always in relation to Bohol, but we also call it Mindanao. How often were they exchanging with the people from Northeastern Mindanao? And how do they affiliate with those people in Northeastern mm -hmm. North Mindanao? Mm -hmm. Sorry to give you that impression. I mean, uh, the way oh, I picture it, it, no, no, no. The, the way I picture it is like in the same way that there is a lowland and highland uh, traffic of, uh, of population, the same in, Bohol, in between Bohol and North Mindanao. In the middle, uh, uh, coming in, the okay. same, okay. the same. And it, it, with exchange again of goods, but as well of beliefs and yeah, trade and everything. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And because... I think it's also, it's not necessarily regarding the, the uh, we're reconstructing concepts of maps, I guess, because for example, uh, in Negros Oriental, the, another island near Bohol, it doesn't really relate to, uh, to other islands, to some islands. So it's mostly, it doesn't relate to Sikihor as much, which mm -hmm. you would think is uh, it's a, an island very close to Negros mm -hmm. Oriental, but because mm -hmm. of currents, pottery exchange between them was not, mm -hmm. they didn't really trade a lot of goods. So Sikihor mm -hmm. was trading with other islands that mm -hmm. was further away because they couldn't get too much to Dumaguete because of the current. But so Dumaguete was mostly trading with Iligan 
uh, sorry, um, the Pitan area because it was favorable for uh, sea, for the sea trading. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if there was also that issue regarding Kamigin, uh, that the, the, the trades were only established during this time. And, but I guess that's also, uh, anyway, so what's your, that's, your, that's my comment or my idea on this. Sorry. Mm -hmm. A good, a good thing for uh, is like when the explosion happens, the volcanic explosion in 1871, the way people react was going around the island, southeast and northeast, and um, going from Katarman, do you remember Katarman in the west, going southeast and then going to Mindanao. And then people from the West, the more Visaya people were going to Bohol, some of them. So that represents very well the two connections. Yeah, that's interesting. Because yeah. of course it's going to be easier for them to, at that time. At that yeah, time and because for them as well as their history and their, their, their current links as well are in there, that land. So yeah, it's, it represents very well in many ways, in many layers that the, these two connections with the, yeah, with the Visaya wall and but with the Mindanao walls as well. Oh, that's very, that's a very good concept of the geography, uh, geographical movements of people. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question. I, I'm sorry to go, go through this. Uh, uh, Marie Andre Pallion asks, is the story that you gathered, did they come from indigenous peoples or did they come from ordinary or from other people in Camiguin? Uh, yeah, the, the, the concept of indigenous people as well currently is quite uh, sort of, uh, interesting uh, level, no, or et etiquette. But yeah, some of them were from in, from the from the people in, from the uh, highlands, the Kimigin tribe, members of Kimigin tribe. Specifically, the story of that Umihon, the warrior, the healer that fought against the the Muslims. So this is from them. This is from them. However, the other story of this uh, all wise person, uh, Basileo Mabilinga, is from the lowland people. It's from the Visaya people. Okay. And the Bisaya people, do you know that they, they have more history? They've been going around, right? I mean, they, they're not... How, how far is their generation when they lived in Kamigin? Or do they go around from one place to another? I didn't understand your question. Sorry, Anna. Uh, sorry, the lowlanders, the, the Bisaya people that you talked to, uh, mm -hmm. did they live in the area for a long time? Or how long did they live in that area? Well, uh, the people, the person who was reporting me about this, about this local agent was lowlander for one or two generations, but as well connected to highlanders. Okay, yeah. and one or two gener two generations is already enough to establish a lot of relationships, relationships yeah. with mm. uh, the people there. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Palion. Uh, she's uh, saying that. Uh, how did you gather the ritual story or oral chant or else did you get it chant was it chanted like the sugidanon of central panay sorry i didn't get it uh, uh if it's from indigenous peoples how did you gather the ritual story uh or oral chants did you get it like the sugidanon of central most panay? most of the stories i got from the, the, the tribe the kimigin tribe from the Highlanders, the, uh, it was there is a, a the national office for indigenous people in Sagai in the village, and they have a group of the tribe has a, a group of researchers that, that are com compelling all all their history and traditions and legends, and then I had access to these documents, and it was through them that I was accessing to 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 to, to have the information to describe some of the rituals and beliefs and that they all display in the, in the form of fiction in the first chapter. So I get it's a proper ethnography. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And there's another question here from Aimi. She is currently a graduate student in UP and also from Kamigin. And uh, she has a question, but not just for Dr. Andres, uh, but for everyone who is working on Kamigin. So she's just wondering, if we, you've all made efforts of communicating the results of your research to the people of Kamigin directly. You've got really ex interesting results and you all seem so excited to talk about my island among yourselves as intellectuals. I'm just wondering if the LGUs in Kamigin, for example, know about this. And this is also a very important. That's, that's a very good question because it's more the social part of this work. No? And I, I am, um, 
I am not academic person. I am more in, in, in between the academia and the role of action. And I, we worked quite a lot in this regard. We worked quite a lot on updating the LGUs and the schools about the fundings and trying to, to develop some initiatives like archaeological excavations with UP and the submarine division of National Museum, uh, some forms of theaters like based on those fundings in order to with a and we think that for different reasons we, didn't, we were not able to um, to engage in this enterprise in this adventure the local government they and they put us apart they probably believed that they were, we were raising a lot of attention or we were raising a lot of stuff and they were probably quite jealous about this and uh, you know how politics work in the philippines and we, we were not successful in that regard but there was a lot of intentions, a lot of attempts for that. And the book, sorry, just to finish, the book wow. is the product of this frustration. The book is the product of me collecting a lot of information, trying to develop into actions within the island, being cut and frustrated on that, and then put it in a book for the people of the island. And that's why the fiction side. But that's the origin of the book, basically. It's, it's too bad that Lee Neri isn't here anymore, uh, because he can also give some ideas on how he was... Mm -hmm. Uh, try, he was also preparing on, on giving some of his uh, ideas and his research proposals to the LGU. So maybe that can be the work of the future peop uh, people. Uh, who else has worked in Tamigin besides both of you? Or Aya, are you, do you have, I, I, I guess one of the things that I can actually say is that uh, to answer that question is that there is all, I think there's always an effort to uh, Involved. We never. When you do a research like uh, like this, you always go to the LGUs directly as well. So to because they have to know and they have to get involved mm -hmm. as well. Um, mm -hmm. And when uh, there's always the effort that whenever you're finished with your project, you have to share it with the local governments, the local schools, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's uh, and it's always it's it's always a continuing thing. So, hmm. and maybe this can be with the with the publication of your book. It can be uh, re people can start learning more about it and maybe return to absolutely. Return to That's why I was advocating in the presentation of you going back to Camigin and, and to, to to double check these fundings. Hmm, absolutely. Yeah, hmm. or maybe uh, this uh, student, I mean, hala hala, you can. Uh, continue with this work and you can work with us as well. We can also work with you if you're continuing your research in Kamigin. So that will be uh, that will be an exciting time, I think. It will be a mm. collaboration with mm. everyone. Mm. Uh, yes, and you would... Uh, uh, June Velez also is also asking, how do we get a copy of the book? So there's a link uh, above. You can go to Save Your University Press and you can order it from there. And uh, so that's, uh, I will be your marketing agent. So we can put Thank you, Anna. I do appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think uh, there are other more questions. Um, oh, Aimi Halala mentioned that. Thank you for answering the question. I will share the book to my friends. And I already promised, uh, she already promised her mother a copy. Okay, because her mother works at the LGU of Mahino. All right. So <laughs> it, Exactly. Uh, thank you, Aimee. It all begins sometimes with something like this. So, mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. we, we're very excited that there's a lot of people who are talking in the Binala talks. All right. I'm sure uh, Arturo has put the link in the chat. All right. Uh, I think there's a lot more questions, but we have to uh, start closing this, this talk soon. Um, but for now, you can, I think you have, if you have any other questions uh, for uh, Dr. Andres, you can email him or you can chat him or best yet, you can buy the book and then I'm sure you'll have more questions and then you can ask him the questions that you have once you finish the, this exciting the book. book. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andres, uh, for this uh, pleasure. My pleasure. For indulging us. Thank you. Thank you to my co-moderator JJ. Thank you to Dr. Victor Pass, Aya, and Michael, and everyone the everyone who attended, who asked questions. That's also it's always exciting to have different discussions. So this is the for me. This is the 
one nice thing about the binalo so it's really more of the discussion instead of lectures and answering questions all right um for next week our binalo talks will be at an earlier time at 12 noon it will be given by kat gutierrez and the title of the talk is uh, Regino Garcia, an artist of scientific statecraft, and it's about 19th century uh, botanical art. Uh, it will be at 10 a.m., my apologies. So, uh, yeah. yes, 10 a.m. is um, for Wednesday. So, uh, we will have, instead of uh, lunch, we will be having our midday um, morning recess. Okay. Where, where is she talking from? My wife, Anne. I think she's from the U.S., sir. Mm. She's um, and this will be in collaboration with the uh, uh, SES department. With so Dr. Benji Vallejo will be uh, co-moderating with. Let's make sure it's clear to to uh, people who frequent the Binalo talks. This is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I will. You know, like that, you know, people might look for the time at one o'clock or two. Yes, yes, that's true. If it was one afternoon, I wouldn't be too uh, no. um, worried. But if it's 10 a.m., I will uh, I will advertise. No, I will market it. Good. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Andres, again, for that fascinating talk. And thank you for uh, waking up early and giving this talk for us. Uh, thank you. We hope that you will... Uh, when you visit, come by again, and then you can give another talk for Binalo. Mm -hmm. Gracias. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Gracias, Victor. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Take care, all of you. Thank you. Bye.